All right, well, we're going to go ahead and start up. Um, I'd like to thank everybody joining us today. We've got a nice group of attendees out there. Welcome to today's uh, CNCF webinar, um, Get Your Windows Apps Ready for Kubernetes. Uh, I'm Randy Abernathy with RxM. I'm the Cloud Native Ambassador and I'll be your host. Um, we're going to also welcome today's presenter, Stephen Follis, Manager of Solutions Engineering at Mirantis. A couple of housekeeping items um, before we get started. Um, during the webinar, you're not able to talk um, as an attendee. So there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you can drop in questions. And what we'll do is we'll just sort of collect up the questions as the webinar progresses. And then at the end, we'll use whatever time we've got to kind of knock down um, as many of those questions as we can get to. So uh, feel free to add questions at any point in time. And um, at the end, we'll, we'll kind of um, pick up as many as we can. So this is an official webinar of the CNCF. And as such, it's subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please um, don't put anything in the chat uh, or in the questions area that would violate that code of conduct. You know, just be respectful um, is the bottom line. And so um, really with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Stephen to kick off today's presentation. Stephen. Excellent, thank you so much, Randy, and welcome everyone to this webinar today. I thank you uh, for trusting us with your time this morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you might be. Uh, my name is Stephen Fallis. As Randy said, I run a team of solution engineers at Mirantis. Uh, prior to that, spent almost three years at Docker, working with container customers of all shapes and sizes. Uh, and I'm excited today to talk about the intersection point between the Kubernetes container orchestrator and Windows workloads. And so today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about, you know, why Windows containers? It's one of the most common questions I get when we talk about this topic of why would you even wanna do that? So what, what's the purpose there? So we'll set some context around why running Windows workloads with Kubernetes makes sense. We'll then move into some use cases, some common rationale and common things that we're seeing customers choosing uh, this technology approach for. And then we'll spend the majority of our time talking about what I'm calling real world considerations. So things that we've seen in working with customers to help make your own adoption of this technology uh, as smooth as possible. I do have uh, some time for a demo today. And, and as Randy said, we'll leave some time for Q&A here at the end. Uh, so with that, let's, let's jump right on in. So as far as uh, why Windows containers, um, this is a question we get all the time. You know, the containers are a Linux thing. Um, they came from the Linux world, C groups, namespaces, baked in the Linux kernel. Why are we talking about Windows? Uh, well, as many of you may be aware, uh, beginning with Windows Server 2016, Microsoft introduced support for Windows containers, which are analogous and very similar to their Linux container cousins. Uh, this then allowed us to take legacy .NET based workloads running on Windows Server, containerize them, and then get the benefits of containers with those Windows based workloads. And so uh, one of the things that we've seen over over the last several years is that there are still a lot of Windows applications out there in the world today. Uh, so the IDC just a few years ago estimated that over 70% of applications that are running on premises today are running on some sort of flavor of Windows Server, be that 2012, 08, 03, 2000, uh, apps that have been around for a long time. So while we oftentimes in the industry really enjoy talking about uh, the new shiny microservice framework or things like Node.js, Golang, Rust, um, Python, in reality, there's a significant amount of applications that are out there in the world today um, that can use the benefits of containers to breathe no new life into them. And so this is uh, by targeting these on-prem workloads, it allows folks that are operating on-prem environments to shrink that footprint and become more efficient with how they're able to operate those workloads today. Secondly, from a people perspective, we still see a lot of developers out there that are utilizing the C-sharp programming language. And so uh, nearly a third of respondents to the Stack Overflow developer survey are stating that they're still writing a lot of C-sharp, which uh, predominantly and historically is associated with Windows Server-based workloads. There are certainly with .NET Core that's starting to change, but a lot of the C-sharp out there is still in, in the .NET framework family. Speaking of frameworks, we still see ASP.NET and .NET um, near the top of lists from Stack Overflow around uh, the top framework choices that are being used today out in the industry. And, and so ho hopefully all these numbers are painting a picture. There's still a lot of applications out there uh, that we can go after and that we can focus on containerizing and getting the benefits around portability, around scalability, and then all the capabilities of Kubernetes alongside them as well. So from a use case perspective, we see a variety of, of values that folks find with containers and Kubernetes. The first is around consistent operations. Historically, we've 
we've had different siloed stacks of how we built and ran applications. So over here, I may have my Linux team that are running kind of Nginx based applications and they do things one way. And then over on another side of the organization, we have the Windows team building and running Windows apps differently. Um, there's, all, there's large discrepancies between the two there. What Kubernetes allows us to do nowadays is to take uh, one standard cluster, the Kubernetes technology, and then be able to run a Linux-based application that we built last quarter and a Windows app that we built last decade and run them side by side on the exact same infrastructure. This greatly decreases operational complexity by breaking down those silos and having consistency between how we run applications. It allows us to set up one set of firewall rules, one set of, of infra, one set of RBAC. We do everything once rather than every single time for each different kind of, of application. So consistency is, is a big benefit that we get uh, with, with a myriad of different applications running on Kubernetes. Next is around legacy .NET workloads. Uh, we stated a second ago that there's a lot of, of .NET out there. Um, and, and those applications are typically in, in need of, of some tender love and care. Uh, right now, it, while you may have developers that are building greenfield kind of net new applications and can take advantage of very seamless deployments and build experiences. Whereas the teams that are supporting legacy .NET apps uh, are oftentimes still running you know, manual build scripts. You know, they're running lots of PowerShell scripts to be able to build and compile those applications. They're opening multiple RDP windows to different servers and copying and pasting web deploy packages between them. Uh, you know, there's oftentimes a lot of manual work um, that's being done because back uh, when those applications were created, there, there weren't a whole lot of better options there. And so containers allow us to bring characteristics of more modern frameworks and be able to use that with this more legacy code. So we get a, a smoother deployment experience, a smoother scalability experience, and just a better operational um, context than what we've had historically. Third is cost savings. This is really one of the biggest. Oftentimes, especially on-prem, we have VM sprawl. We have lots and lots of VMs everywhere, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of VMs, many times operating at 40% utilization at best, sometimes 30, 20, or, or, or below. Um, so not very utilized VMs. And it makes sense. Nobody wants to run out of resources, so we over-provision those VMs. Um, and that can be costly to manage, costly to maintain, uh, and can just be costly in general. And so containers allow us to take the exact same applications that are running on those VMs and be able to run them on less infrastructure through the multi-tenancy nature of Kubernetes. So we can run them side by side and get much higher utilization uh, in a Kubernetes cluster than we can on many standalone VMs. And so it's, it's, it's cheaper from an infrastructure perspective, it's cheaper from a management perspective. And then for those users that are looking at, at public cloud as an option, what we find is that that VM that's running right now on-prem at 20% utilization, um, you know, we already um, expensed that whole, that whole blade server, that's not a big deal. But as we go to the public cloud and we start char being charged on an OpEx model where every single second we're being charged, you know, 80% of an unused VM starts to get pricey, right? So by utilizing less resources, either on-prem or in the cloud, we can save substantial money when it comes to operations. Speaking of the cloud, cloud migration is often front and center in many organizations today. Uh, containerizing um, creates a very elegant way to be able to shift applications from running on an on-premises context up to a public cloud or even multi -pu multiple public clouds or hybrid. Uh, containers are in intrinsically portable. It's one of the best benefits of of them. And so by containerizing a Windows app, we're able to more easily move that to the cloud. So we can containerize today and then in six, six or 12 months down the road, choose to move that to the public cloud, or we can containerize and move to the public cloud all at once. So we have some options there on where we want to run the application and it enhances the flexibility of when and how we move to that public cloud or back on prem if, if need be. And then finally, DevOps. Um, Applications that have been built over the last four to five years have been able to benefit from uh, the DevOps pipelines, you know, continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, automation of all the things. Um, however, on the Windows side of the house, we haven't always had the ability to use those ty types of practices with our legacy applications. So from a DevOps perspective, we can now have very consistent pipelines of how we build Linux containers and then how we build Windows containers with those different kinds of applications, thus simplifying our, our processes and uh, taking advantage of a lot of the automation that DevOps and Kubernetes um, afford for us. So these are five of the, the main buckets that we see interest around as far as why to containerize and run apps on Kubernetes. But the number one reason that we've seen over the last three years is all around Windows Server 2008. So you may 
I've seen um, on, on Twitter or blogs yesterday, but as of yesterday, Windows Server 2008 is now officially end of life. And so this means there are no more um, security patches or hot fixes coming from Microsoft. We are, we are past the extended support date, uh, standard and extended support. There's nothing else coming there. And so there are, um, that said, there are still a large number of Windows Server 2008 servers that are out in the, in the world today. And so those now, as of yesterday, are starting to represent severe vulnerabilities from a security perspective, from an audit perspective, from a governance perspective. And there's a bit of a gold rush now to try to move workloads off of Server 08 and onto more modern um, and supported operating systems such as Windows Server 2016, 2019, et cetera. And so this has been a big driving force over the past year is everyone looking at, well, what are we going to do with all these workloads that we have running right now in 08? And there are several options. Uh, the, the main ones we see are, hey, we're going to refactor and upgrade this application. So we're going to take this .NET Framework app, tear it apart. So let's go recode it in the brand new shiny .NET Core, move it onto uh, you know, Windows Server 2019, and we're good to go. Uh, that's a great pathway, uh, but it typically doesn't scale very well. So if you have one or two applications, that, that, that may be an option. But when we're talking about a portfolio of 100 or 500 or 1,000 applications, there's simply not enough manpower and time to be able to go in and, and under, undertake such a massive shift in, in application. There's a lot of rework. Many line of business apps may not have a, a real visible ROI for going through and investing that much time and resources. So this, this refactor and redevelop the application can be challenging. Uh, next is a custom support agreement from Microsoft. Uh, um, they typically come with a lot of zeros on them. So now that we're after that date, um, it's simply not practical for many organizations based on the price tag of having very custom bespoke support from Microsoft for those workloads that are running. Uh, best case scenario is that it's a, it's, it's a temporary band-aid and that you're still going to have to address those applications sooner rather, you know, at some point down the road. It's really kicking the can down the road. Similarly, many cloud providers are offering uh, limited support, really just some security fixes, if you lift and shift those virtual machines from on-prem up to a public cloud provider. Uh, so that is an option. Uh, again, you're still running on an, an outdated operating system in the cloud, just like you were on-prem, except that it may cost more at this point because now the, the pricing model of the cloud is different. Uh, so that lift and shift is an option, but it, it's, it's also delaying the inevitable. You're going to have to do something for those applications. So th those three are options, but the one that we've found to be the most compelling is around containerization. So we can take an application that's running .NET Framework on a VM today, we containerize the application itself with its configuration, thus decoupling that app from the underlying operating system. Once containerized, we can throw away that server 08 environment and move the container forward to Windows Server 2019. Without and oftentimes without code change. Usually it's configuration change, adjustment to web config files based on environment, those types of things. And so from once containerized, we then deploy onto Kubernetes and then we get um, a lot of those benefits of the deployment model without having to undergo substantial and costly redevelopment efforts. Furthermore, if we we fast forward to two or three years down the road. If we need to go through this exercise again, we simply in our Docker file, change the from statement to a different version of Windows, recompile the container, and now we're able to cope with additional upgrades down the road. So it's a more future-proof path than investing all that manual effort today. So this containerization path is, is a really um, compelling way to be able to mitigate the Windows 2008 that are still within environments and provide a more future-looking way of running that, that application code. Okay, so now as far as um, kind of why we're going to go and run this, let's talk about kind of how and some of the things to think about as you're beginning this journey down the path towards Windows applications on Kubernetes. So the first place I like to start is around the server operating system. So what are you going to run these containers on? I mentioned that um, Windows Server 2016 introduced support for containers, uh, but there are actually a couple of different main branches of how we can go out and get Windows Server. So this may be review for many of you, but I like to touch on it because it's not as universally known as, as I would expect. Uh, but Windows does come in two different flavors. Uh, the first is what they call the long-term servicing channel or LTSC. 
This is when, we, when you see Windows Server 2019, 2016, 2012. Those are all on the long-term servicing channel. And, and really is what I think about when I think about Windows Server, right? So we get a new version every two or three years. We have the five plus five of support, five mainstream, then five of extended. And this is really focused on stability and, pre and predictability. So Microsoft is typically not shipping bleeding edge features into the LTSC because they don't want to rock the boat. This is where historically we've built you know, mission critical workloads on top of the very stable LTSC. Starting, starting with Windows Server 2016, uh, there was also a second channel that has been opened up and they call it the semi-annual channel or SAC. So if you've seen Windows Server comma version 1909, version 1903, 1809, 1709, any of those types of numbering scheme, that's related to the semi-annual channel. And this is an, a very different release channel. So there, you can't kind of bounce back and forth between the two. When you install a server, you select kind of one path or the other. And the semi-annual channel, this is different in that uh, we, they ship a, Microsoft ships a new version every six months, typically in the spring and in the fall. 1909 was just released a few months ago. Um, these come uh, with, with all the latest features. So then these are much more bleeding edge. And so for technologies that are emerging, such as containers and Kubernetes, uh, the semi-annual channel is where Microsoft puts all of their newest and shiniest new features there first. And then every time they cut a new LTSC, those features typically are then rolled back into that LTSC branch. Um, the downside to this that we often see here is that the SAC comes with 18 months of support. And that is oftentimes uh, too short of a window for some organizations, especially for those that may be on premises that have uh, very stringent uh, qualifications and processes for approving operating systems. So you may be saying, look, hey, we just, we just got server 2016 approved six months ago. You know, there's no way we can move to something this quickly. Uh, and that's understandable. So uh, typically if you're in the cloud, uh, micro Microsoft and Rensis, we would recommend looking at the semi-annual channel because that's where all the bugs are being fixed first, where new features are being released. You're going to have a better Kubernetes experience on the semi-annual channel, but you can still use Kubernetes with Windows Server 2019 on the LTSC as well. So that host operating system matters. Um, what also matters is the base image that you're building off of. So in the container world, uh, you may be aware that everything is built up off a concept of layers. It's not one large blob or one big binary, uh, but instead several distinct layers that make up an, a container image. In the Linux world, you may be um, used to building on Alpine based images or BusyBox or Scratch or one of thousands that are available on the Docker Hub. In the Windows world, we, everything derives from three base images. The first being nano server. This is the smallest image that's available. Um, on the latest semi-annual channel of 1909, this clocks in around 100 megs. Um, it, it'll be larger on different versions of Windows. The sizes change uh, quite drastically, to be honest. Nano server is great for greenfield and cloud native apps. So if you were building a, a .NET Core application or Node.js and you wanted to run that uh, with Windows, you would typically choose nano server to do that. So it's uh, also if you had any kind of PowerShell scripts or kind of automation or ETL type jobs, you may be able to put that into a nano server to keep the container size small. And it's typically when you don't need full .NET framework. If you do need the full .NET framework, that gets us into the second base image, which is server core. Server core is really is our, is our bread and butter when we talk about legacy .NET applications because we have full .NET framework. And so it's really targeting uh, those legacy based applications that have been around for five, 10 plus years. And so we can go in and install those types of applications into server core and have all of the components that they need to operate. Um, if you, if there's an application that you're containerizing and you hit a roadblock because it's missing some component of Windows, we also now have a third option that was introduced with Windows Server 2019, and that's this Windows-based image. Uh, this, is, this carries the most Windows components that are available and goes really above and beyond what we have in server core. So if your application makes heavy use of Win32 APIs or other uh, pieces of Windows, this would be kind of a last stop of, of something to try to be able to containerize that app. It's much, it's more expensive than server core. Where I've personally seen Windows more in this Windows-based image utilized is for uh, customers that are looking to do things like headless browser testing. So we um, something like a Selenium grid where we're going to uh, spin up servers, uh, we check in some code, spin up some servers and then do browser testing and we wanna test on Windows. That 
uh, the Selenium driver pieces historically have not worked with server core, but they did work with this Windows base image. Uh, so that provides us more capabilities. Uh, we typically recommend start sticking to whichever base image is going to result in the smallest container available. Um, so while something may work in Windows as a base image, server core, if it'll work in server core, we always recommend server core. Uh, and likewise down to nano server if it, if it would run there. Keeps things nice, small and efficient from an image perspective. So why we're talking so much around OS versions and base images is that in the Linux world, you're likely familiar with the fact that we don't really have to you know, care that much about the host. As long as it's got a container runtime, we're typically good to go in Linux. On Windows though, we have to care about version compatibility. And so I've got a, a small chart here. It's a simplified version of what's in the Microsoft docs here on this link at the bottom. Uh, but you can see here from a host OS version, if we're running Windows Server 2019 as our host, then we need to make sure we match and, and align the base image that's running inside of that container. So we would need to have a Windows Server 2019 image that's inside of that container. Um, if, we were, if we had a base image of 2019 and tried to then run a container image based on 1903, it's going to stop us, not allow us to, to run that workload. That's because um, the Windows Windows API and kernel has been undergoing such change in, several, in the last several years. We want to ensure that the host and the container match up so that we don't have any um, errors or, or weird issues with a mismatch between those two. Um, and so this is uh, based on what we call process isolation, which is the default mode of running containers, both in Linux and in Windows. And uh, so in a process isolation, if I have five containers on the same host, they're all sharing the host kernel and that, and that host operating system. Alternatively, in Windows, we do have a second option that we call Hyper-V isolation. Hyper-V isolation is specific to Windows containers, but it allows us to wrap a, a running container in a very thin virtual machine where that container gets a dedicated version of the kernel just for that one container. And so historically, for standalone Windows server containers that are running without orchestration or for other orchestrators, we've been able to utilize this Hyper-V isolation, uh, but we are in the process of bringing that in the Kubernetes. So it's currently an alpha feature, so not quite ready for prime time today, but over the year, over this next year in 2020, we expect that to mature greatly. And it's under active development here to bring this option here. Uh, what Hyper-V isolation allows us to do is a little bit more flexibility around version compat. So in here, if I had um, a host um, operating system of 1903 that's running on in my cluster and someone gave me an image that was based on 2019, I could then run that container image on top of that host utilizing Hyper-V isolation rather than process isolation. So again, coming soon, but wanted to kind of mention it now so that you can be thinking about that in the future and ensuring that you're matching up of these versions here. When it comes to the cluster makeup with Windows Server, um, this should look very similar to you. So in Kubernetes, we have this notion of master nodes that are the brains of the operation. I think of them as air traffic controllers that are doing all the kind of the organization and operations of the cluster. And then we have the worker nodes that are running our actual container workloads that we specify that we give Kubernetes to run. Historically, we've had all Linux. So the masters were Linux, the workers were Linux. Um, so as we've introduced support for Windows Server into the environment, they are available as Windows worker nodes only. Uh, so one of the questions we get all the time is, hey, we're a Windows shop. We don't really like running Linux VMs if we don't have to. Can we do a full, you know, pure 100% Windows Server cluster and still run Kubernetes? And so the, the short answer right now is no. We do require that master nodes are running the Linux operating system, and then we can add one or more Windows Server worker nodes that are there today. Um, and so right now we do need a mix of Linux and, and Windows in the environment. Um, so at this point, if I had a cluster with a mixture of worker nodes and I wanted to go deploy um, a Windows container, say running IIS, and I gave the pod spec and all my YAML gave it to, uh, you did a cube cuddle apply and, and the masters went to schedule it onto a node, that Windows container could potentially wind up on any of these four worker nodes, Linux or Windows. If a Windows pod was to land on top of a Linux node to be scheduled though, we'd, we'd have an error, it would not be able to operate that. Uh, and so, you know, eventually Kubernetes may retry and try to reschedule. Uh, but what we'd like to do is, um, is have a more elegant approach to ensuring that Linux pods run on Linux nodes and Windows pods run on Windows nodes. To do that, we utilize features inside of Kubernetes, specifically taints and tolerations. Uh, so what I could do here is I could use kubectl to go and, uh, and to taint those nodes 
nodes with an OS of Windows equals no schedule. And then that would uh, block Windows nodes from running on those, Windows pods from running on those nodes. Uh, when I go to deploy an actual Windows pod though, I could then specify a toleration that would uh, allow me to go on top of that taint and to schedule. And then I could even use something like a node selector to ensure that the pod is being landed on a, on a Windows node. So over here on the right, I have three worker nodes. Uh, we have a Linux, a Windows, and a Linux. And so if I'm deploying with this node selector of Windows, that pod's going to land on a node that has that label where we have that match. Um, so we, we've historically done this in various ways with labels. We're simply applying those same, that same technique uh, to Windows um, instead. So we didn't go reinvent the wheel here. We're utilizing uh, currently available um, techniques inside of Kubernetes. Starting with kube 1.17, we also have the ability to have a node selector based on this windows-build command. So you can see on here on the bottom, we have 10.0.17763. That is the build number of Windows Server 2019, that LTSC branch. So if I had a Kubernetes cluster that was mixing for some reason of LTSC nodes and SAC nodes, I can further specify my node selector, which, uh, which node for that to land on based on that node selector command there. So we're getting even more granular, not just Windows, but that LTSC or that particular build number of Windows is there available as well. Uh, so something to, to think about. Um, I'm The very first Windows pods that I've scheduled, I was trying to figure out, hey, why are these not coming up and working? Well, it's because they were trying, the Kubernetes was trying to assign those pods onto a Linux node. Uh, that's not going to work. You've got to make sure that we've got node selectors and taints there to uh, ensure that the pod lands on the right node. Some general things to keep in mind, and we've talked a lot about Windows Server 2019, uh, that really is the, the floor of support for Kubernetes. So uh, starting with Server 2019, a significant work went into making uh, Server 19 work with Kubernetes. And so if you have uh, some dependencies there on 2016, that's where either standalone servers or alternative orchestrators may be an option, but we need Server 2019 or, uh, or version 1809 on the semi-annual channel to be able to support Kubernetes you know, or newer. We touched on the node selector piece, always something to keep in mind. Um, there's a concept in the Linux world called privileged containers, which is where a container has, um, I don't want to say carte blanche to the host, but significant access to the host of what it's able to do. They're, they're special and they run in a much higher privileged mode. And so these are good for some daemons and agents and other use cases and are, are are common in the Linux world, but are, we are unable to do that in the Windows world. The way that Windows containers are put together, we don't have the ability for a privileged container. And so that limitation pops up in various times. I wanted to kind of mention that um, if you're wanting to have a Windows container that is somehow manipulating the Windows registry of the host, that's going to be blocked. There's not a way to be able to do that. Uh, you, you could be able to edit the registry inside of the container, but we, we have more of a separation and more of a security boundary there than what we have in, in Linux. Uh, we touched on the Linux master pieces. Uh, and then finally, when you're creating pods and you're setting resource constraints or, or allocating resources rather, uh, you really going to need to bump up the minimums in which you may be used to in the Linux world. Um, an IIS image running on Windows Server Core, which is a large, you know, five gigabyte sized image, um, is going to require much more resources than an Nginx container running in Linux that may be 10 megs, for example. So you will need more uh, resources when we go to deploy Windows containers. They're simply heavier based on the other components of Windows that are running inside of that container. They need more resources there. Something to keep in mind, it's very easy to accidentally starve pods by not allocating enough resources when you're running those, those pods. Uh, for a little bit of history, uh, we mentioned starting way back in 2016 with the initial container support. In 2017, the uh, container network interface work began around CNI to get the networking going with Kubernetes. And then work continued throughout 2017 and 2018 culminating in a release back in March of 2019. This was the stable release that initially brought support for Windows Server into the Kubernetes project. So starting last March, uh, we got the thumbs up, kind of the GA release there. It says we're stable and we're good to go. Each subsequent release after 1.14, the, the groups at SIG Windows, at Microsoft, at Docker, at, at VMware, at a variety of companies that are involved in the community have worked uh, to add feature after feature into Windows Server. And so in 1.15, we've got output support for GMSAs. We'll talk about why those are important in a moment. Um, in in 1.16, we started initial support for CSI and some support around storage. And then 1.17 started looking at how we can change uh, the, the user that we're running inside of the container with this run as username flag that's available. 
So uh, we'll see additional um, features this year with 1.18, 1.19, et cetera, as they come down the path. Uh, but know that there's active work going on. The, the work is just beginning around Windows Server and Kubernetes. It's not completed. So there'll be uh, new features in each release to look forward to and to expand the capabilities of the platform for, for .NET based applications. So to get into different considerations, the, the very first thing that we often run across, right, is identity. So we've containerized an app, we go to run it, and boom, we've got a problem. It's, uh, we're having issues with identity. And so we always suggest that folks take a, take, um, take a good look at how applications work beforehand to understand how they work. You know, are they using basic auth, forms-based, integrated Windows auth, with something like Kerberos or NTLM? And then also looking at uh, what are the resources the app needs to talk to? Can the, you know, are there certain databases, file shares, MSMQs that an app needs to work with? You know, we need to know that ahead of time. If we're utilizing integrated Windows auth, we're going to need some additional considerations as well. And so what, what we find is that the vast majority of apps over the past 10 years have been written with integrated Windows auth. Um, IWA has been very simple from a developer's perspective. I clicked a little box and voila, I have authentication in my app. Very convenient. Uh, and the way that that magic worked was because I was typically running on a web server that was in close uh, coordination with an Active Directory domain controller. So that server is what we call domain joined. And so then when that application ran, I could have the web server and the host itself talk to Active Directory and handle that user authentication for me outside of my app code. Very convenient uh, and very easy to operate. In the container world, uh, we do not domain join every single container or, or every single pod to a domain controller. Instead, the pattern is that we domain join each of the host nodes that we're running on top of. So if I have 10 Windows Server 1909 worker nodes, I would domain join each of those to a domain controller. And then I would then, I would then utilize an Active Directory component, something called an Active Directory Group Managed Service Account. This is, a, this is an AD thing, it's not a container thing. Um, it's a component that's been an AD for several releases. And it's essentially a passwordless service account that I can load into a container and then assign permissions for that across my network. So the way this works is that uh, if I'm running a kubectl apply to go create a pod, uh, I pass in a credential spec, which is simply a, a JSON representation of, of that um, service account. And then on the server that it lands on and that, that the pod is being scheduled, the host compute service of Windows picks that up and says, hey, this is, this is a special pod. It's not uh, kind of of a regular identity. I actually need to go and send that credential spec to the container credential guard, another component of Windows, so that it can talk to Active Directory to generate and maintain Kerberos tickets. Then I'll create the container I'll, and I'll set the identity um, to that specific service account. So that anytime that container calls out of the container to a database or a file share, it'll then utilize that service credential, not the default identity that's there. So this is something that uh, I like to talk about first because it's, it's almost always the first thing we run into. And in many organizations, it means coordination with your Active Directory team, talking with that identity team around, um, hey, we're going to need these service accounts. We need to add these permissions and grant these permissions to those service accounts. And there's typically some legwork that needs to be done to be able to enable um, Kubernetes to work with integrated Windows auth based applications. Um, inside of, of Kubernetes now, we have a custom resource definition, a CRD around GMSA credential spec, where we're able to pass in information around our domain, uh, around the, the, the SID for the account, the domain name, NetBIOS, uh, standard AD information that we can pass into Kubernetes. And so when we create a pod, this will be loaded in and, it, and that identity will be then utilized as part of Kubernetes. So this feature has gone from alpha uh, to beta over the past six months and excited to see this reach uh, stability here shortly. But a very key foundational tech for when we're working with uh, Windows containers. The next piece that comes up is, is oftentimes we may hit a problem or we want to keep tabs on what's happening inside of the container. For Linux apps, these typically log to standard out. So if I'm needing to go in and see what's happening in the container, I can go uh, do, run a, you know, a Docker logs command. I can run an interactive session with my container runtime, something like Docker run or kubectl logs. Any of these commands are really built to take the standard out of the container and pass it through back to me as the user so I can see what's going on. Alternatively, in the Windows world, we, Windows apps don't log to a standard out. So they typically go to the uh, event tracing for Windows, ETW. Uh, they go to event logs. They go to custom files. They go to different spots. And so if you've ever run Docker logs on a, on a Windows container, it's pretty anticlimactic. There's not a whole lot that's there because there's nothing being sent out to the standard out. It's, it's being sent to different areas inside of that container. So to address this, uh, Microsoft spent some time over the 
the past year doing some great work around a tool called the Slog Monitor tool. So this is a small binary that's going to help us get the same experience that we have on Linux, where we go application to standard out, and then have our container runtime pick those up with Docker logs or kubectl logs. We can bring a similar experience to Windows. So in this example on the right, we have a Windows container our app and services are writing in these metrics locations. We have a log monitor binary that's reading those, passing them to standard out, and then the runtime is then able to run Docker logs and kubectl logs to be able to get that information. So very handy and very useful and, and good to put in uh, to adopt this earlier rather than later. It's when you're trying to debug uh, a, an application that's not working in a container, having this log monitor tool can make a big difference because otherwise you're typically doing a Docker exec or a kubectl exec session inside of the container and trying to parse through XML or error codes in, in an exec session and, it, and it's quite painful. This makes uh, life a little bit easier, easier and allows you to integrate into third-party logging tools that are built to, on that standard out of the container to get their information there. So very useful. It's available on GitHub. It's open source. You can grab it. And they've got several Kubernetes features on the roadmap that are coming for things like config maps, like sidecar patterns, um, lots of goodies that are coming down the line there. So with that, thank you for sitting through all those slides. I want to jump into some demos and, and, and make this a little real for folks as well. Uh, so what I've got here um, is that I have a Windows Server 2008 virtual machine. I went ahead and just pre-recorded this so I didn't break anything. Um, but it's running here is Windows Server 2008 and a virtual machine. Uh, this is a web server running IIS, IIS 7 to be specific. Uh, and also running on this site is something called the Job Site Starter Kit. This is about the oldest site I could find on the internet. It's a .NET 2.0 app that came off the CodePlex site, which is uh, long, long gone, kind of a pre-GitHub thing. Uh, it's a two-tier application talking to a server, to, uh, SQL Server 2008 database. I can log in with a username and password. Uh, and from there, I can, I can post resumes, I can look at jobs, I can set a company profile. Think of this as a, an incredibly low fidelity LinkedIn, uh, but a very old, old app, 10 plus years old, but it's simulating a line of business app that may be running in your organization today. Uh, so to get more information about the app and how it's running, I often like going to the, the IIS manager to get information about the app. You know, how are these app pools configured? How many app pools are there? I can see I've got a uh, jobs app pool. So that's running there with one app. Um, it's running .NET 2.0 and we've got a, a service account, a, an app pool identity there of jobs-svc. Um, so that, that's good information to know. When we go to sites, we see we've got our little job site here. We can go in and see different configuration, different um, user authentication can be looked at here as any kind of SSL, you know, bindings. We can come in and see the source code that's available here with our master pages and our ASPX pages. That's all here on the local disk. Now we're going to copy all of these files up. I'm going to um, send them over to a machine that has a container runtime, that has Docker installed. And so we're going to move this on from a server 08 VM over to a server 2019 VM. And so we have all that exact same code right here, brought it over as really a starting point. Uh, from here, we're going to open up Visual Studio Code or your editor of choice for that application to start building out a Docker file to create a container from that code. So we can see there are our application codes here. Uh, we'll go and open up on that Docker file and we'll kind of talk through the pieces of how it was fit together. So up at the top, we escape. We have we set a new escape character, makes it easier for Windows because the slash uh, is a new line character in Linux. It gets kind of wonky. This little um, line one is a really nice piece there to allow it for Windows. Uh, we then use a base image running on an LTSC 2019 base image of Windows Server Core. And this is actually an ASP.NET image. So Microsoft has not only the raw base images, but they build some derivative images on top. That includes a default website, so we remove that. We come in and configure any OS level um, operating system features that we need. So in the web world, this would be things like directory browsing, you know, HTTP errors, ISAPI is a common one, uh, static content. Um, very common pieces that we would need for our application to run from an OS level. So we run that with the standard PowerShell commandlets. Now containers come in with all the ports um, shut down. So we have to expose the ports that we're going to use uh, for that web application. In this case, we've got three different ports we're going to open up here. Uh, and then we start using standard um, PowerShell commandlets for web administration to configure an application pool. So we create the app pool, we set the identity there to local system, it needs to be local system or network um, service to be able to use the GMSA. We then copy in the, the physical paths of all of our files. If we needed, if we wanted to handle SSL in the container, we can copy certificate. 
objects. Uh, we can set ACL so that IIS can access all those files. And then we go and we initialize that website. So we set up an IIS, a site, we set up bindings, any certs, and do any of the other configuration that we need for IIS there. Typically we could stop there, but what I like to do and in a lot of images, especially if you're debugging, is to enable remote administration for IIS. So these are a few extra lines that are going to allow us to use that IIS manager GUI against a container. Makes it a heck of a lot easier to figure out what's going wrong or what's functioning there. Finally, we'll add support for that log monitor we just talked about, where we download a binary, we add it into the container, uh, we set a config object to say which areas of the container we want to monitor, and then we set a shell and an entry point. I said the log monitor is started as part of that IIS process there. So that, that's a standard kind of rundown of what we do with a Docker file to then uh, be able to build and run um, that container. So to start off with here, I want to run a couple of containers before we get to our custom one uh, to show kind of what that experience looks like for Windows. So we're going to set a couple of variables, really just for some naming conventions there. And then we're going to go and we're um, going to make sure we don't have anything running here. But then we'll go and run a standard, just IIS basic image. This is oftentimes a base image that we may use. If we have a small website we wanna add in, we can start and build right on top of that. Uh, so we're going to uh, run the container with IIS. We'll then open Chrome and we'll go ahead and uh, tail out the container logs so that we can see what's coming out of that default experience there. So we select those, run them. And then here locally on this machine, Machine. We run an IS container, we pop open Chrome, and we see IIS, not running locally, but running in a container. I can refresh this a couple times, generate some traffic on the command. We see nothing coming through logwise. You know, there's nothing there, nothing to be used. And that's very typical for Windows containers based on kind of how that logging experience works. Uh, very typical and what we expect to see anytime we would be running something like Docker container logs or kubectl logs, nothing really to see there. So, um, that, that's one of those uh, kind of gaps that the log monitor tool is going to help us with when we get into operating our own container. So I'm just going to drop a note here, removing this container in the future. And then it's on to building the Docker file that we showed a second ago. So same command as we would in Linux, Docker image build, we give it a tag with a name and we say where's the Docker file. So go out and build and boom, it's been cached, but usually this takes a few minutes, typically longer than a Linux container. Uh, but we've built that image and now we're ready to run that image. So we're gonna do a very similar process here uh, where we run a container and we pop it open in Chrome so we can see that running locally. And immediately we see a problem here. Login failed for user NT authority. So the container is trying to go out and talk to the database. You know, we didn't change the connection string. It was set to utilize integrated Windows auth and that app pool identity, but the database said no who this anonymous user is. It's not going to give them any results back. And so we have this user authentication issue that's popping up. A very common in any kind of application that may be calling out to Active Directory secured resources. So what we do is inside of Active Directory, we'd come in and generate a new GMSA. We do that with a simple PowerShell commandlet where we give it a, a DNS host name, some service principal names, etc. And then we run an install command on those servers. And now that account would be created in AD. I pre-created it for time. Uh, we then create a credential spec file, which is a commandlet that essentially talks to Active Directory and then formats a JSON file with some information for it. It's a read-only operation, not considered super um, um, secure. It's just simply reading uh, against Active Directory. So we see information around the domain, a lot of the same information that we would then take and plug into that CRD for a GMSA credential spec that we saw a second ago in the presentation. So at this point, we have a GMSA in Active Directory. We have a credential spec file, and now we can go and run a container with that credential spec. So we're going to bring the two together. So we're going to uh, delete the existing, that pre-running container. We're going to run the new one, but this time passing in that GMSA. Um, and at that point, uh, the container, when it calls out of the container, is not going to uh, use that anonymous ID, but instead it's going to focus on that Active Directory service account for use there. And you'll see here in a moment, we'll see the exact same website we saw earlier. Um, should look and feel similarly. It's the exact same source code, simply running in a container this time rather than a VM. So I can go and I can even log in to that, to that database where my user credential pieces are. Then the application itself is, is talking to the database and then enforcing kind of what I'm allowed to do there. So I can go and post jobs, I can search resumes, all that same experience there. The last piece to, to kind of mention here and show, 
um, is around how we can kind of work from a debugging perspective to identify um, if or when we had issues from the containerization perspective. So the first piece we do is, is we can look at the logs. And so immediately you see that it's not uh, on that IS based image earlier, there was, it was just crickets. There was, there was nothing coming through there. And, but on this image, because we're using that log monitor tool, we see the worldwide publishing service enter the running state. And we're seeing information coming back from IIS directly here in that Docker logs command. So kubectl logs will be able to pick this up and be able to uh, let us know what, what's happening inside of that container. We wouldn't have to go in and you know, do an exec session to be able to, to see some information there. So I just wanted to show an example of that working in the real world. Next, we're going to, um, I mentioned that we had enabled remote management here. And so I'm, I'm opening up IIS manager on the host machine. I can go in and connect to a server. I'll give it the IP address for that container. Then I give it the username and password of the account I want to connect with. And now I'm able to use this full rich GUI experience to in introspect how the IIS is configured inside of that container. Uh, this is can be incredibly valuable, especially if you have dozens of app pools, dozens of sites, lots of things going on inside of the container. A lot easier utilizing this than digging through kind of alternative options there. So we look at bindings, different settings, authentication, everything you would expect to be able to do inside of IIS, uh, we can do here as well. So at this point, um, we've looked at the application. The last thing to do is we'll go and we can log into a, a registry, a container registry push this image into the registry, and then we're ready to go from a Kubernetes perspective. We can add that image into our YAML, um, up, kubectl will apply that to a cluster, and then this image will go and be scheduled onto a node. So just to recap, we started in a virtual machine running Windows Server 2008, took that application code out onto Windows Server 2019, built an image, added IIS remote management, log monitoring, and then was able to push that into, you know, another, a, into a registry there. So hopefully that's, hopefully that's uh, kind of showing kind of the, the workflow that we often go through when, when we're looking at containerizing those kinds of applications. Uh, to mention, uh, to close up on, on, when, on other considerations, persistent storage is, is the other big one in the room that we often see with legacy apps. So identifying what kind of app you have for that application. Um, is it persistent? Is it okay if it goes away, such as a cache? Um, how large, are we talking 10 megs? Are we talking 10 gigs? Um, are we talking about databases, file shares, local disk, knowing what the application interacts with is critical. And this can often be hard for, app, for, for a line of business app that was built eight years ago. The dev team's gone. It's used by only five people internally, but you can't get rid of it. You, it, it may take a little bit of time to introspect and figure out how that's working. Uh, databases can often be easier uh, because we can use the same connection string information. We can typically leave databases where they are. Uh, with DBs, we can containerize them, but I often prefer to leave them on the VMs that they're at today, containerize the app, and then just call, call out to the DB over connection strings. It's typically easier than moving the app and the database all at the same time. Uh, you can kind of phase it out. Um, sensitive values for like passwords, connection strings, certificates, use kube secrets for that. Another kind of standard best practice for Kubernetes gives nice RBAC enabled separation so that the right user can see the right um, sensitive information and it doesn't get mucked up down in your container there. So a very mature way of handling those secrets. In the Kubernetes world, when we're talking about storage for Windows, it's a little bit different than Linux. Uh, so in the, in the Linux world, CSI, the container storage interface, is much further along. That's really becoming the best practice of, of how to do things in the Linux world. On Windows, flex volume, uh, typically with SMB and iSCSI are the ways to go today. Um, we're, those are entry plugins, and so we're hoping uh, over the next year that this story will improve. Uh, we've got a lot of great work happening with SIG Windows around external provisioners, around kind of initial support for CSI. Um, it's coming soon, but again, we needed those, um, uh, we needed privileged containers for CSI, and so we're looking at alternatives since Windows don't have that available there today. So if you're working today, SMB and iSCSI are your best bets with flex volume or utilizing one of the cloud-based providers if you're running in a public cloud already. Those are also so good options. So to summarize, containerizing legacy apps is a great way to gain agility and flexibility and be able to run older applications just like you would a brand new microservice app you're building from scratch. I definitely recommend that you start small and develop muscles around Kubernetes first. Kubernetes is, is incredibly powerful, but there is a learning curve. And so uh, everybody always wants to go out and find the biggest, most mission critical, you know, gnarly application in the whole organization and start there. I'd really recommend more of a crawl, walk, run approach where we gain, we, we choose some applications that are 
uh, are not um, hello world, but, but ones that we can learn and, and grow on to solidify our understanding of Kubernetes and of Windows Server, and then go out from there. And then finally, uh, consider things early. So think about the identity needs you're going to have for that app. Think of the dependencies you have across other resources in your network from a storage perspective, from a security perspective, from a monitoring perspective. Identify those early so that you're not right in the middle of containerizing and thrashing trying to find the things that you need there. Uh, but taking these into account, uh, we are just very excited that Kubernetes now enables us so much more power and flexibility for those applications that may have been built five or 10 years ago to run side by side with an app we built you know, last week or the week before. So some additional resources, check out SIG Windows. This is the special interest group in the Kubernetes community where a lot of this work happens. They even have a full Kanban board available where you can go in and see the features that are coming down the, down the pipe. Uh, including some documentation here on Microsoft and Kubernetes as well. Finally, uh, that we have a full white paper available that was put together from the team at Docker when we were there around delivering safer apps with, with Docker Enterprise and Windows Server. So it really targets this kind of scenario of legacy Windows-based applications there. And with that, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. I, I know it's been a whirlwind tour through Windows Server and Kubernetes, uh, but we do have a few more minutes. And so uh, Randy would love to see if there were some questions that we can speak towards for the remaining time. Hey, Stephen, thanks a ton for a great presentation. Super awesome stuff. Um, yeah, so if you've got questions, just go ahead and drop them in the Q&A um, box down there at the bottom of the, the window. We've got about, uh, you know, four minutes or three or four minutes to, to run through some. Um, I think we've got a good, you know, 10 or 12 questions at the moment. So let me start off with a couple of softballs, though. Um, sure. How do people, you know, what's the best way for people who are interested in, you know, Windows development on Kubernetes to kind of keep up with what's going on in Kubernetes, what the, you know, what new features are showing up, that sort of thing? Yeah, great question. That's something that I near and dear to my heart because I'm always trying to keep up to date at the best I can as well. Um, I, I sent a link to that um, that Kanban board here. Um, this is uh, Patrick Lang at Microsoft and the rest of the SIG Windows team do a really great job of keeping an entire pro like sprint planning board of what's being worked on when. So you can see the whole backlog of here's all the features we'd love to get into Windows and Kubernetes, but then they divide those out based on release. So I can see, you know, for the release 1.18, I can look and see the exact cards that are being worked on, the exact features that are being worked on for that release so I know what's coming versus ones that may be slated more in the 1.19, 1.20 type time frame. That's a great way to see what's going on. Uh, additionally, for, um, back at KubeCon in San Diego back in November, there were several sessions that were all based around uh, Windows, uh, Windows Server and Kubernetes. And those were some great resources to, to really get much uh, deeper dives into what we were able to touch on today. Uh, but the, the KubeCon events have started really doing a great great job at providing robust coverage of Windows Server as a topic point for a lot of those sessions. So those are those are two of the ways that I um, t try to keep sharp there. SIG Windows also has a, a weekly or bi-weekly meeting um, that they that they host for the community. And so there, there's notes, there's discussion notes of every one of those meetings. There's YouTube recordings of each of those uh, community meetings. Feel free to jump on those calls in those communities and, and, and to use those notes as ways to keep up on what, what are folks talking about? You know, what's what's working well? Where are some of the pain points we're trying to make better? Uh, it can be a great way to, to, to get a, a snapshot of what's happening in the community and the, they do a great job of being very transparent and open with all of their work and all of their plans. Yeah, I can, I can definitely um, echo the conference side of things. I actually hosted a talk by um, a gentleman from Docker and from Mirantis at um, KubeCon San Diego, and it was just really fantastic. And I know this is a lot, you know, in the hopper for, uh, um, you know, for the European convention coming up. Another thing too, that like for me, I don't know how you feel about this, but I always like to look at the release notes if I need a low bandwidth kind of uh, glance. Yes, at it. Oh, that, that's a great recommendation, Randy. So every, every time there's a major release of Kubernetes, uh, there's uh, usually in, in the last several ones, there's been kind of an entire section of what's new in Windows type of yeah, things, yeah. talking about GMSAs and storage. And so that, that's a great quick hits way to, to see what the, the big major headlines are for during the release. Great, great. Azure ads and yeah, all that. Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, so next one, it, uh, Prometheus is, is hugely important to a lot of people for mm -hmm. monitoring. How does the Windows side fit into the, you know, to the, the world of prom? Ah, oh, yes, of course. Monitoring is, a, is, is very important. So, um, and the prom stack, typically we're talking about utilizing the, the node exporter project on our Linux nodes. And so there is not a, a sheer uh, ver Windows version of node exporter, 
uh, mainly because Windows is built differently and it's a very different architecture. And, and so there is a project on, on GitHub called WMI-Exporter. Uh, that's being maintained uh, and so WMI exporter uh, operates in much the same way so it goes and it's scraping metrics out of the the Windows management interface WMI and then uh, providing those onto a, a an endpoint that's sitting there on the server that allows Prometheus to go and scrape that endpoint and bring those right in uh, alongside all the things that it's collecting off of Linux nodes. Uh, furthermore, from a Grafana perspective, from a dashboarding perspective, there's several really nice pre-built dashboards that are there on the, I think it's Grafana Labs or the Grafana Gallery, uh, some, some pre-built dashboards that are available so that you can take that WMI information and then and give you a good starting point of how you want to format and, and, and look at that information right there uh, with the rest of your cluster information that's there. So WMI-exporter um, is the main tool that we would use to be able to integrate nicely with a prom stack, deploys very similarly to node exporter. So nothing's, nothing's too different than what, we're, what we've been doing in Linux. Super cool, so uh, open metrics adapter, essentially. Mm -hmm. awesome. Exactly, yep. Cool, um, and then from a compatibility you know, standpoint, um, how do you you know manage all the version stuff and the version numbers and things? What's the easiest way to tackle that stuff? Yeah, well, it, it's something, uh, to be blunt, it, it's a challenge, uh, especially for long-lived clusters where you're updating, if you're on the semi-annual channel and trying to update your those clusters every every six months, it can be a challenge. And so automation is the key, is, is, is key. Uh, so what we can do in, in Docker files themselves, on the, when we have the from statement, we have an image and then we have a colon and a tag. And so that tag, we don't have to hard code into there. We can use a, a Dockerfile argument to make that Dockerfile dynamic. So at, at, at Docker build time, I can have the option to pass in um, OS version A into there, or I could pass in OS version B when it's available, or next month, OS version C, I can make those dynamic. And so if you can add um, CI CD pipelines with those container images, that goes a long way for making that easier. And then from a, uh, from a host perspective, that gets into, you know, using whatever kind of information, infrastructure automation tools you have, either some of the cloud providers, some, you know, something like Packer, if you're rolling it on your own on-prem, or choosing a Kubernetes platform where a lot of that kind of operational management is taken care of for you. Those are all some options to be able to make sure you're keeping up up to date on the latest and greatest. One of the other easy, from a nodes perspective as well, you may just choose to um, just simply in the notion of cattle, just if you've got five um, existing nodes, you can just add five new ones, cordon off all the old ones, drain them, and then kind of uh, remove those and have everything flow onto the new nodes as well. There's, there's just different options, but it's something to think about because it, it feels different than what we've historically done with Linux. And that's why I like to call it out and put so much emphasis on that. So automation is king. Yeah, indeed. Cool. Well, you know, um, unfortunately, I think that's about all we've got time for. Um, but I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining us here. Um, the recording and slides will be online later. There's a, a link in the chat, um, but you should just get an email if you signed up, um, giving you all the information you need to follow up after. And um, I hope everybody has a fantastic day. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.